Amazing Church family, how are we this morning? Wow, so there's like five people. How are we this morning? Come on, give me some energy. There we go. All right, guys, welcome, welcome. Happy Sunday. Good morning. Please stand and join us together as we worship the Lord our God, guys.
neighbor, shake a hand, ask someone how they're doing this morning. malfunction but we're back in business God is able. God's still worthy of our praise right these are just tools that help us worship what God really wants in worship is your heart so let's lift those up together God is able and he will never fail he is almighty God Defeated the grave, raised to life. Our God is able. In His name, we overcome. For the Lord, our God is able.
Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning. I'm Chris. I'm Murdoch. We're doing some Sunday morning announcements. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Uh, as <laughs> you're figuring this out. As you came in, you should have received some sermon notes from one of our ushers. Uh, if you didn't get one of these, you're going to want one of these. It'll allow you to follow along with the sermon. There's a study guide that'll take you through deeper uh, Monday through Friday, getting into the Word. If you need one, you can grab one at the back. Um, also towards the back, if you're new around here, you'll find restrooms back there. We've got coffee and water in the back. And we do have a great nursery ministry, but if you happen to keep your little one in here, we have a family route back to the side. That's that great uh, mirror back there. You can see this way, so you can go back there, still see and hear everything, but get some privacy with you and your little one. If you're joining us online, uh, everything that we're talking about, links to the sermon notes and everything else, our team will be putting in the chat. If you have any questions, just go ahead and let them know. Yes, and if it's your first time here, or maybe second, third, fourth, or fifth time, but you haven't like filled out any information, you can do that by simply texting hello to 562-568-7575. You'll get a reply, and then you'll have to fill out some information from that reply. Uh, but if you don't want to do that, like Murdoch said, you can scan the QR code on this through your bulletin. Uh, if not, if that also seems like too much work for you, you can go outside to the Welcome Gazebo, and there you will see Steve Gower and Rory. They will be greeting you and saying hello and give you a nice present. Uh, and they, yeah. Why, why let you know that we're here? You get yeah. a present. You get a return. present. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's why you're here, to get the present. Which, if you are one of those guests and you're new around here, and you're wondering, where do I start? There's a lot going on at church, like what's happening? We have a thing called Starting Point, and uh, that's where you want to start. And that is happening every Sunday through April, which I know this is the second Sunday in, but it's fine. You can jump in next Sunday. That happens at 9 a.m. upstairs in the Family Center in Pastor Ken's office. Pastor Ken leads it. It'll be a great time for you as a guest to come in, get to know the lead pastor, get to know what's going on here at Calvary and some of those uh, starting points. Um, also, today, if you are a young adult which is ages 18 to 30. That was going to be my next question. What's a young adult? <laughs> Shelby. Shelby is a young adult. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> look how that gets an applause. Um, if you've never been, it's a good time. We're going to be meeting up from 4 to 6. That is upstairs in the belong room over in the buildings on that side of the campus. We're upstairs. I'll have a sign up there pointing up the stairs so you know where to find us. There's food. There's a message. We're going to be getting into, like, what is my life's purpose? Oh. Yeah, like, what direction do I take in life? Career? Family? Like, what is all that about? So I'll answer all of that in 30 minutes, and you can go home happy. Um, but there will be a good discussion point as well. That's do you have to be 18 to 30? Because... You haven't figured it out yet? No, not yet. I'm still working on that one. You got hired on staff last year. That's your <laughs> direction. There we go. All right. Pastor Ken tells me what to do. Let's move on. Wednesdays, University. Wednesday, University. That is Kid U. Kids, uh, that's kindergarten to fifth grade in the Calvary Kids Room. Uh, you have the youth. They're doing uh, uh, university for them. That's going to be in the youth room. And then us as adults, we have a parenting thing. So parenting is difficult. Parenting is hard. I have two of them. And those kids, well, I was going to say those parents, but those kids are difficult sometimes to, to figure out how to manage them throughout their phases in life, from being little to now uh, we have a preteen and just trying to figure all that out. So we'll be in the uh, fireside room answering those questions and talking about that. That starts at 6 o'clock. It goes to 730. So if you have a youth, take them to youth. If you have a kid, take them to kid. And if you have children, come to the parenting thing. And if they have kids that are too young for the youth and for the cover kids, we do have child care, right? We do. Yes, we do. So you can have that come in. Uh, coming up in a couple Saturdays from now on April 27th in the morning from 8 to 12 a.m., we are having the Women's Ministry Auction. <laughs> These people have been, and they know that's why you should applaud for that. It is a great time. It is $16 for a ticket. That's breakfast included. It is a great time for the ladies to come together. If you want to get involved in that, after the service out on the patio, They'll have their booth set up. You can go and buy the tickets. And it's only for a couple weeks now that you can get those tickets because, again, it's the 27th. That's coming up quick on a Saturday. And uh, also outside, after the service, I know a lot of people go out that way. If you go out this way, there's all the ministry tents set up. So if you're a guy and you're wondering, what's here for guys? Go to the Kingdom Men Tent. We've got Celebrate Recovery. We've got kids. We've got youth. We've got Belong. Everything is out there. So after the service, go that way and uh, connect with some people. Yes. And also on the 27th, we are hosting TCMI Praise Night. So you, the Teen Challenge Ministry, so you may have gotten this flyer coming in. And so it starts at 3.30. That's going to be 3.30, 5.30. is just going to be a fellowship and food trucks. That sounds like a great time, right? Fellowship, food trucks, can't get better than that. 
And then from 5.30 to 8.30 is going to be the worship experience in here. So that's going to be happening. We are welcome as a church to be part of that with the Teen Challenge. Uh, it's going to be a great night of just worshiping. If you just want to come and just praise God and, you know, sometimes you think, hey, those guys talk too much. We just want to sing. This is that thing for you and that. So, Fellowship and food trucks. That needs to be a ministry. That does. That does. Uh, so that's all the announcements we have. So next is offering. So if we can have the ushers come forward. And Pastor Murdoch will pray for us. All right. And again, this is, if you're a guest around here, if we're not here to take your money, you're just welcome to come and uh, join in with us with praise and worship and getting into the word. But if you do give this morning, we're just so grateful for your generosity. That goes so far. God takes what you give and multiplies it out to get his good works done. But I know that he's also doing a good work in your heart for, for uh, donating there. So if you can bow your head and close me. Bow your head, close your eyes and join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just come before you, grateful that we have today to be able to come together. But I know that there is so much going on in all of our lives, whether it's a morning of just celebrating good things or just a morning of mourning over some hard things. Lord, we come before you just to give you ourselves, um, just our very beings, right? as we give um, of our treasures, what it is that you've given us for sustenance and provision. Pray that you would bless those that give during this time, that you know all of their needs both their physical needs, their emotional, spiritual, and that we trust that you can meet those needs. And I pray that you would bless them. I pray that you just take this and multiply it out into our community and around the world to help support our missionaries and just everything that you are doing. And Lord, uh, I just thank you for our church family, that we're able to come and uh, love on one another and be part of a family here. And I pray this all in your name, Jesus. Amen.
build our life upon, Lord, that will, when we build our life and our things and everything about us upon you, it will not be shaken, Lord, it will not fall. Thank you, Lord, for that. And just thank you for all that you do for us, Lord, and help us to remember this truth that you've given us, that whom shall we fear? What do we have to worry about if we have you, Lord? Nothing will prevail against us as long as we're with you. And I thank you, Lord, for all you do, Lord. And just pray for peace and blessings upon the people here in this room today, Lord. In your name, amen. How are we doing this morning? Good? Awesome. Good to see you. Man, uh, so I just want to say this right up front. Uh, some of you have already heard, and I know Patricia put something on Facebook, but uh, Dan McIntosh uh, went home to be with the Lord last night. Um, he actually had a heart attack, sudden heart attack, and went home to be with the Lord. So I, I know you with with me and with us. Uh, Murdoch was talking earlier about being a family, and uh, we're praying for the Macintosh family, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful that because of what Jesus has done, we have a home in heaven that is real, and that is, it's not just, I hope he's in a better place, but Dan is in the only best place called heaven. And so uh, we're so thankful for that today and just knowing him. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, in the, in the next few days, you'll hear more um, about what's going to happen with that as far as the service and those kinds of things. But I just wanted to, you know, it's kind of shocking news this morning for us as a church body and just wanted to um, let you know that and uh, just have you continue to pray for the McIntosh family. So um, Patricia is just a faithful, godly woman in this church that's been our office manager for many years. And so just keep them in prayer, all right? Okay. Actually, let me pray. God, we, we come before you this morning and just, God, really no words except, God, may your grace and comfort and peace just fill this family. God, we thank you for Dan and what a gift he's been to this, this family. And I pray, God, that you would just bless them as they walk through this, this season. And um, thank you for our home in heaven. Thank you, Jesus, for all you've done for us. And just pray your blessing on, on the service today in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. 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 Okay. So... Um, we're going through the book of Romans from start to finish, from start to finish, right? We're calling it from start to finish. And so last week we started and today we finish. No, we don't. We, uh, we started last week and uh, we're going to go about uh, almost about 40 weeks through this. So it's going to take us through summer and into the fall, you know, those kinds of things. So it's going to be good. So here's the thing. You got the notes. So you're going to take some notes today if you want and follow along with the scriptures um, just this section in Romans chapter uh, 1, verses 18 through 32. So it's kind of this, this section. Um, and and I'm, I'm calling this today the bad news about you. The bad news about you. So look at the person next to you and say, there's bad news about me. There's bad news about me. This is the bad news, okay? So uh, here, here, here's the good news. We're going to start with the good news. I like that good news, bad news thing, right? Good news the, the key verses that we ended with last week, Romans 1, 16 through 17, says, For I'm not ashamed of the good news about Christ. Right at the top of your outline there. It is the power of God at work. Do you believe in the, the power of God at work? Okay, how about the rest of you? You believe in the power of God at work? Yes, all right. So the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight, makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. 
As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. So it's all about faith and God making us right. Now the bad news is, if, there, if God's got to make us right or righteous, there's something wrong. You know, you know what I'm saying? So if, 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 if God has to make me right, then there's actually something wrong or unright or unrighteous about me. So um, John Stott says this. He says, nothing keeps people away from Christ more than their inability to see their need of him or their unwillingness to admit it. How many of you do not like to go to the doctor? How many of you wait way too long before you go to the doctor? You know, you're like, no, I, I, I'm just, oh, I, 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 I feel horrible, I look horrible, I can't move, but I think I got this. <laughs> I'm like, you, you, you need to go to the doctor, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, I love it, like on Sunday mornings, you know, people come up, I'm like, hey, how you doing? I give them a hug, what's going on? They say, I'm sick. I'm like, oh man, why didn't you tell me that? <laughs> tell me that, yell that at me across the parking lot or something, I don't know, like, I'm sick, stay away, you know, I, but, uh, like, you know, I, I, I'm like that too. I don't like to go to the doctor unless, you know, it's just like, oh, man, you know. Um, Jesus said this. He said in Mark 2, 17, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have to come to call, I have come to call the, uh, not the righteous, but sinners. Jesus said this, not saying that there are righteous people who don't need a Savior, and then there's sinners. He was saying we're all sinners, some of us admit it, and some of us think we don't need the doctor, right? And so he's saying we're all sinners. And so when we talk about recovery and redemption and all these things, it starts with admitting that we have a need. We're not right with God. We start by saying, okay, let's admit it. We're not right with God. We need to be made right with God, so become righteous in him. So here's the bad news today. And, and today, it's all bad news. Aren't you glad you showed up today? It's all, I gave you the good news. Now, just for the rest of the time, it's just bad news. It's downhill, bad news. And uh, you're like, oh man, now's the time for me to go get that coffee in the back and just walk out. Okay, so, uh, but it's bad. Here's the bad news. You, you gotta get this. This is the bad news. Without God, my life is a complete wreck. Look at the person next to you and say, yours too. Okay, so yours too. My life, bad news, my life without God is a complete wreck. I am selfish, I am sinful, I am arrogant, I am prideful, I am fearful, I'm angry, I'm bitter, I'm clueless, I'm confused, I'm depressed, I'm desperately wicked and headed to hell without hope. My life is a wreck without God. But, okay, I'll give you a little bit of good news. But God. Two words, but God. My life's a wreck without him, but God came so that my life would be redeemed, not a wreck. That's the good news. Now let's get back to the bad news, okay? So, I need to be made right. Why? Because without God, I'm, I'm a wreck. The verse, the good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight from start to finish. So, the, when we go through Romans, it's interesting how the Apostle Paul is writing this letter, and he's kind of making a case right at the beginning. Like, here's the good news, but then he starts making this case. And for this next section, now, this, this next section in Romans, in the Bible, is um, really um, kind of found between two huge buts. Now, I know that sounds weird, but uh, I, I, I know that sounds funny. But here, here it is. Romans 1.18 says, But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. We go to chapter 3, which will be there in a few weeks. Romans 3.21 says, But God now has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. So, God, but God, anger, heaven, sinful, wickedness, but God has shown us how to be made right. So we're going to, over the next four weeks, we're going to break this down into what I'm calling sin, part one, part two, part three, and we're going to work through this sin. Like, what is sin? Like, we, we you know, what, what's going on with that? What exactly, and how does that affect us? And, and uh, I'm going to say it this way. I'm worse than I think I am. When it comes to sin, I'm worse than I think I am. Like, I, I would tell myself, I'm not that bad. 
I'm not as bad as Stephen Scott. Like, I know him. Like, I've, you know, then they're Justin McCourt, man. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, we're, we're in different leagues of sin, okay? So, uh, no, I'm, I'm, but I tend to do that. Why? Because I'm a sinner. Like, I want to make myself, I'm, 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 I'm again, I'm, without God, I'm selfish. I'm going to compare myself to someone that's, that I think is worse than me. But it's like, oh man, we, we want to get into sin. Like, what is that? So over the next few weeks, now if you really want to get in and dig into this, you got to take that study guide and you got to work through it during the week. Because I'm going to like barely like touch the surface. <clears throat> so you get into it during the week and then you come into that life group next week and you unpack some of that stuff. Unpack some of that stuff. Talk about the sin within. Talk about what's going on. Talk about the bad news. Your life's a wreck without God. I'm not the only one. You are. We're all a wreck without God. So Paul gives us this clear picture in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32, of the clear picture of what sin is and what it does. <clears throat> so I'm going to do this. I'm going to take four steps down into the darkness and have one great response to that. So think of it this way. This message is kind of going to work through this way. Four steps down into the darkness of sin, but one great response out. So, number one, God reveals his anger. God reveals his anger. Verse 18 says this. I'm going to read this section, verses 18 through 20. It says, but God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God, but because he has made it obvious to them for uh, for ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Turn to the person next to you and say, no excuse. Come on, say it. No excuse. You got no excuse. And you're, and you're looking, uh, so God reveals his anger. I, this passage, like right here, there's two like two words that, that just bug me this week in, in this passage. And I know they're, they're different, maybe in different translations, but anger, God reveals his anger. I'm like, I knew it. I knew God was angry. I knew it. There it is, right there. See, God is an angry God. We, we saw it in the Old Testament, and I just knew. I, what, Pastor Ken, finally, you're going to get up there, and you're going to tell God is angry. He's angry at you. He's angry at everybody. He's like an angry ogre up upstairs just like waiting for people to mess up to squash you. God is angry at you. It's an angry God. It says it right here. But God shows his anger. Now, this is the thing though. The word for anger here is the Greek word really translated means anger or wrath, but it's a settled, determined indignation, not a momentary emotional blow up like you and I have. It's a determined indignation. It's controlled. It's, um, it's what we call righteous indignation. So remember, remember in the New Testament, Jesus comes into the temple and he turns over the, over the tables. Was he angry? Yeah, he was angry. Like he turned over tables, booting those religious salespeople out of the, out of the temple and he says, my father's house is a house of prayer. Now, do you think he said, guys, can I just tell you something? Move your tables. Um, you shouldn't be in here. Is there any way I could get you guys out of here? You know, this is supposed to be a house of prayer. You made it a den of thieves. I don't think so. I think he was turning over tables. He, it says he put a, a kind of a whip together. And he was chasing the religious hucksters, salespeople out of the temple. And he was saying, my father's house is a house of prayer. You've made it a den of thieves. He was angry. That was righteous indignation, which most of us, I would say, well, you're going to say, well, when I did that, I was righteous. No, nah, I probably wasn't, okay? We, we're, we're not like God in that, but this angry God He's very controlled and emotional. So God is emotional, but it's a righteous indignation, not just a blow up. So God shows his anger when? And the way it's said here actually means constantly. Like he's always revealing his anger, 
or his wrath in judgment, in consequences, in things that happen, discipline, all these different things that happen at the cross. We see the wrath of God brought at the cross. God shows his anger. What's he angry about? Well, it says, sinful, wicked, sinfully wicked, and it's, and it's that, sinful, wicked, ungodliness and unrighteousness, the lack of reverence and the lack of rules. Like you, you know God is there, but you treat it like he's not. You're not, you might say, well, I'm not an atheist, but you are what are called a practical atheist. You live as though God does not exist. That's ungodly. No, there's a lack of reverence for God. And unrighteous is a lack of rules. You do what you want. And it says that people actually are suppressing the truth about God. God is clearly seen in creation. You know, if, if you, when I lived up in the mountains, we lived up in the mountains, and we'd look out at night, and the, it would just be like a, a it was almost like a, a black velvet cloth with diamonds laid on it. And we would look up and just be like, oh, that is amazing. I wonder how that happened. No, our, 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 our thought was, wow, God, that is awesome. And we had a friend one time visiting us, and, and I said, look up. She looked, she said, <gasps> she went like that. <gasps> amazing. She said, is that, are there that many stars every night? I said, yes. We can't always see them like that, but they're there. And it's just like this, wow. On a different level, when they, in the hospital, handed me my child, I went, thank you, God. I mean, you look at creation. You look at creation, and you see God. You see a God, uh, just a God of order, a God who's revealed himself. But what it says is people suppress the truth. That means that they hold it down. You actually have to deny it and hold it down. You have to actually say, well, it seems to be true, but I'm not going to believe it. You suppress the truth. You can't deny the existence, but you do. God is angry, and he reveals his anger at sin that separates us from him. So God reveals his anger. Second thing, God re our man rejects his creator. Now we go on in, in uh, verses 21 to 23. And we see, yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give thanks. They began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. They knew God, but they wouldn't worship him or even give thanks. I, I love in this, this passage here where it connects worship and thankfulness or gratitude to God or suppressing that. And, 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 and how the, the connection, this is what God wants, this is what he made us for, is to worship him and give thanks. And yet there's a suppression of that. And we, man in sin turns to himself and it distorts the way we think, it distorts what we see, and it says, we think we're wise, but we become foolish. So how many of you have ever done anything foolish? Okay, I know a lot of you, you've done a lot of things foolish, right? Done some, just some dumb things. Foolish. How many of you thought you were doing the right thing, and it turned out to be the wrong thing? Yeah, I know. I know, we do that, right? So we think we're wise, and we're foolish. We think we're doing the right thing, we're wrong. We exchange a heart of worship and gratitude for our own thinking. It distorts the way we see things, the way we think about things. It says we become, uh, our minds become dark and confused. We make up our own version of God. We make God 
this little God. We make God this little God, and that little God is called an idol. It's like Moses and the children of Israel. Moses went up to the mountain, and he was up there for 40 days, and while they were down to the children of Israel, down there, and they were like, where's, where's Moses? What's taking so long? And they said to Aaron, the, the high priest, hey, hey you, you need to take all, these, all this jewelry and melt it down and make us a, an idol. Remember that? It only took a few days. It didn't take long. I mean, God delivered them out of Egypt and all that idolatry back there and all that stuff. He delivers them out, and about 40 days later, they're like, make us a god. We need to have a god. What does that say? We are made to worship. We, God created us to worship. We're going to worship something, and if we can't if we're going to reject God, we've got to make something that we're going to worship. That's an idol. And so it doesn't take long. We're, why? Because that's how God made us. So a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the cross, and we saw this divine exchange. Remember, we were looking at the cross, and we said Jesus was on the cross. He becomes sin so that we could be made righteous, right? My sin, boom, on him so that his righteousness could be transferred to me. This is a divine exchange. His righteousness for my sin. He became sin, I become righteous through him. Right? Is that good news? Okay, well here's the bad news. Man led by sin does a different exchange. We exchange the truth for a lie. We exchange God the creator for a, a little piece of the creation and make that God. And it says in, in it basically in, in uh, Psalm uh, that you, you, these idols, they have eyes but don't see. They have hands but don't feel. They have uh, ears but don't hear. They have feet but don't move. I mean, they have this. What, what is it? And it says the people who have those are like them. What? Dumb. That's what it says. You, you make this an idol. You become dumb like the idol. The idol can't do anything for you. But this is man rejecting the creator and turning into an idolater. <clears throat> an old preacher named Donald Gray Bar Barnhouse said this, will God give man brains to see things? And then will man then fail to exercise his will toward God? A sorrowful answer to this, says Barnhouse, is both of those things are true. God will give man brains to smelt iron and make a hammer and nails. God will grow a tree and give man strength to cut it down and make, it, make, a, make a handle for that hammer from its wood. And when man has the hammer and the nails, God will put out his hand and let them drive those nails through it and place him on a cross in supreme demonstration that men are without excuse. You see, God reveals his anger. The second thing, men, man, Human beings reject the Creator. Just getting better, isn't it? Number three, God releases man. Now here comes this second word that I'm like, okay, God was angry. Now it says in, in verse uh, 24, so God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. <clears throat> God abandoned them. I don't like that the Bible says that. Because I, I, don't, I don't want God abandoning. Just like I don't want God angry, I don't want God abandoning. I want God with me. Never leaving, never forsaking, all that, right? But it says, so God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, as a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded, exchanged the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. Verse 26, that is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. 
Remember I said my life without God is a wreck. Your life without God is a wreck. Well, God abandons them. What, what is it? It's interesting. The word is really an intense verb. It's paradidomy, which is the same word. It means to give over or hand over. It's the same word used when Christ handed over himself to be crucified. Giving himself over for the Father's care. The Father delivering up his Son as a sacrifice for our sin. That's the same verb there. He gave them up. He gave it up. He gave him up. <clears throat> so what does it mean? Well, indirectly, God withdraws his restraint and protection and allows the consequences. God gave up his son and stepped back and watched what sin does to his son. The brutality of sin. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? Why have you left me? He yelled out from the cross as a fulfillment of Psalm 22. Because God was giving him up as a sacrifice. It says, when God abandons them, us, it means that he's allowing us to do what we want. You know that thing in you that says, oh man, I don't think I should do this? You know that thing in you that says that? I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to. I shouldn't do that, but I'm going to. I shouldn't go over here with these people, but yeah, I shouldn't. I shouldn't do this, but there's, there's this thing called restraint. And I believe it's, I mean, the Holy Spirit, it's God. There's a restraint there. And you, without that restraint, will just be a wreck. That's what it's talking about. And God, when he releases, so he, he lets us go. Okay, do your thing. Do whatever your foolish heart desires. And you end up doing things that should not be done. You know it. I know it. We know it. This is the truth of the Scripture. Our foolish hearts desire things, and we end up going in the wrong direction. And sin affects us at every level, doesn't it? Our mind, our heart, our body, our behavior. And notice again, they worship and serve things rather than God, shameful desires, do things that are shameful. <clears throat> and it goes in and he starts talking about women and men exchanging the natural for a perversion of what God has made. There's no way for me to get with integrity in Scripture, there's no way for me to get around this passage <clears throat> that basically says homosexuality is a sin. And I know some of you are like wondering, what's Pastor Ken going to say about that? And you're wondering, like, or you're thinking, I'm glad I'm not the one up there saying it. But I want him to say it. With integrity, this is what the Bible says. This is what it says. So homosexuality is a sin, and it's, it's mentioned throughout the Bible, and you can read stuff online, you can go wherever, and they'll say it's not a sin, it's this or this or this, but according to the Bible, now, why are women mentioned first? Most commentators think that's Paul's way of saying, because women tend to be the last to give in to this kind of degrading behavior. That he's basically showing it's that bad. It's that bad. I still want to make something super clear. God hates sin, but he loves sinners. 
God hates sin, but he loves sinners. Are you good with that? Are you good with that? God hates sin. God hates divorce, but he loves divorced people. Are you glad with that? God hates sin, but he loves sinners. He sent his son to die for my sin, for your sin. So when we talk about a sin, and like right now, homosexuality, for instance, and we're going to get into a list in a second. But God wants sexual purity because that's the way he's designed us, and that's his will for us. So if we say one sin, one sexual sin is not wrong, then which one is and isn't? And that's why I just like to stick to the word, and this is what it's saying. God made us to worship him. We turn and we go downhill until we, we, be, we just do the worst things. But I want to make this clear. God loves sinners, hates sin. So this is something we deal with. Um, homosexuality is not the sin that if you are in that kind of lifestyle or you practice that or you got into that or whatever, that that's the sin that God says, I'm done with you. I don't believe that's, that's what it's saying. I believe that says, I've done for you everything that can be done, and it's done. So all that sin, whatever it is, it's nailed to the cross. Jesus became that for you. So instead of exchanging him, exchange what he's given you for you, and take that sin and give it to Christ. There's deliverance for every sin, no matter what. You're not too far gone. God's grace is greater than our sin. But there's this downward spiral of sin. And in verse, in the number four here, it says, man removes God and is ruined by sin. And I'm just going to read through this kind of quickly. In verse 29, it says, their lives become full of every kind of wickedness. Sin. Greed. Hate. Now, if you're, if you're, honest right now, you're circling the words that you would say, yep, yeah, that's me. Envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, gossip. Wait, gossip? Let's go back to the homosexuality thing. I don't want to talk about gossip. They're backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, boastful. They invent new ways of sinning. They disobey their parents. Wait. They disobey their parents? Like that, that does that seem to fit on that list? Well, if you're a parent, it does. Okay, so uh, <laughs> they refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse, worse yet, they, exchange, they encourage others to do them too. <clears throat> 21 different vices are listed. It's not unusual for a list like this, whether you're Stoic or Jewish or Christian literature at the time. Can't really categorize it. It's just a list. This is it. Without God, we're a wreck. God reveals his anger. Man rejects that, rejects God. Gets gets involved in all kinds of sin and removes God and is ruined by it. One good response. Number five, my right response is to realize and repent. If you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, I'm going to have the band come up right now. And I want to read this passage because it tells you about our church. 
don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves, those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or are abusive or cheat people. None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. It goes on to say, some of you were once like that. Some of you were once like that. Some of you, he's writing to the church, and he's, he's this church this morning, Ben, you come in, you're like, oh, how you doing? Ben, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm good. Uh, and, and we're like, Ben, I mean, if you, if you knew the person next to you before they knew Jesus, you might be like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. If you want to picture that, come to Celebrate Recovery on Friday night, okay? So uh, it's like, here's stories. I mean, you, you, we all look good Sunday morning, but he's writing this letter. He said, these things, none of these people that practice these things will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Some of you were once like that. But you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. You were once. I was once like that. But now I've been forgiven. I've been redeemed. I've been made whole. I've been cleansed, washed, sanctified in the blood of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. No matter what sin, what sin within, what sin you're in, you can come today and be like the rest of us, washed by the blood of the Lamb. You can be free from that sin. Doesn't matter what it is, you can be free from that sin. Now, do you want to be free from the sin? Do you want your life that was once a wreck without God, do you want to change that life and give your life to Christ and let him come in and change you completely? I hope the answer is yes and amen. I want you to stand with me. And we're going to do this song. We're going to close out with a song called Waymaker. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God demonstrated his love to us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If we will confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. You will be saved. Believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. There's only one way. He is the way maker. And I want to say one more thing. Because some of you are thinking, I'm so glad he was talking about those people today. And not me. As believers, what do we believe? We believe Jesus came to free us from our sin and bring light into the darkness. The darker it gets, the brighter he shines. So how about if we drop our high-beamed interrogation lamp and just let him as the light of the world shine through us. Maybe you as a believer need to walk up today and say, you know what, God? I've been acting like I'm all righteous. I'm not. I'm full of pride. I'm full of self-righteousness. I'm pointing that judgmental finger instead of just opening my heart to you and saying, God, use me. We're going to sing this song. And while we're singing, you want to come up? There's going to be people up here praying. Come on up. Prayer warriors, come on up. You want to pray. You want to accept Christ. Tell them. You want to pray for something. If if you've wandered away and you need to get your life right with God. There were three people in the starting point class today that accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. I want you to make the same decision Come on up. Say, I want Jesus as my Savior. God, bless this time of invitation. It's yours, God. You're the way maker. Make a way. Work in our hearts. Work in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name.
choices, right? It's about choices. We have a choice to make right now. As we enter into this time of worship, the repeating line in this song is, I worship you, I worship you. We could sing that. Um, most of you probably noticed during the first song, my guitar decided it didn't want to play today. I was up here strumming, but it wasn't plugged in. You couldn't hear it. Worship can be like that sometimes. We could be singing. We could be singing the words, I worship you. But do I, am I really worshiping him? That's the choice we have to make. We could say it, we could sing it, we could even lift our hands, but am I willing to worship him, to elevate God in my life, that he's the authority, that he alone is God? That's the choice we have to make. And so as we sing Waymaker right now, let's sing these words and believe them from our heart that he is here moving in our midst. And we worship him. Let's sing together. Moving in our midst, I worship you. I worship you. You are here and working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here and moving in. Stop working. 
You never stop, you never stop working And even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop You are way maker, miracle worker Promise keeper, light in the darkness My God, that is who you are Cause you are way maker, miracle worker darkness my god that is who you are one more time because you are way maker miracle work promise keep light in the darkness my god that is who you are amen so Light in the darkness. Let him, his light, shine through us as we go out. We're all sin- any, any You admit it? You're a sinner, just like the rest of us? So here's, here's the thing about this church. Everyone's welcome. No one's perfect. And anything can happen. Let's go. Let God use us to share the good news. Because the bad news is, without God, we're a wreck. Have a great day. God bless you. Out on the patio. Let's go out there. Out on the patio. God bless you.